Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. In every age, there is a cause worth fighting for. But in the future, the greatest threat to our survival will not be man at all. What's going on? War! We're going to war! Now, the youth of tomorrow must travel across the stars to defend our world. We are a generation commanded by fate to defend humankind. Everyone fights, no one quits. We are going in with first wave. You smash the entire area. You kill anything that has more than two legs. You get me? We get you, sir! But they will face an enemy more devastating than any ever imagined. Vietnam! He's coming! Mayday, mayday, this is what we to do. We're under attack, sir. We need retrieval now. Someone made a damn mistake. No! The bugs laid a trap for us, didn't they? Ah! TriStar Pictures takes you to the front lines of the next frontier. Kill them all! Starship Troopers. And then that's when it hit me when I sent you guys that message. I'm like, wait a minute, I know how to get to Kevin Bacon from Starship Troopers. <laughs> yeah, you go Starship Troopers to, yeah, Top Gun to The Saint to Hollow Man. <laughs> Wow, we are right there. Holy cow, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, it honestly got, I had a fucking heavy ass desk, which I'm now sitting at. I got a brand new, de- or not a brand new desk, but a newest desk that I'm sitting at. I was carrying this heavy fucking thing up into the moving truck from my aunt's house, and it hit me. I was like, oh, I know how to get to Kevin Bacon from Starship Troopers. Like, it just hit me. I'm like, yeah, Sherlock because- Holmes vision right there. It's like the, all the pieces come together. But then you can thank Tony because Tony was like, thank God we took the drawers out of this thing and made it hollow. And I'm like, wait, hot. Ho- Hollow Man. I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, that's got Elizabeth Shue. That's <laughs> oh my God. It was yeah. a Sherlock Holmes moment. Yeah. How we get the Kevin Bacon from Starship Troopers. Yeah. You go Kevin Bacon or you go to, uh, you go Starship Troopers to Top Gun to the Saint to Hollow Man. <laughs> And now, do you want? Do you want to start us off though? Yeah, I mean, Josh and I, I have both. I, I want to do the rundowns of this movie before uh, Tom does his. Uh... Yeah, and I didn't have one ready for today, and I don't really know why I didn't get it done because it's not like I'm fucking doing anything during the week. But <laughs> other than sleeping until eleven o'clock in the morning, which has been fantastic, I have a I have something for the intro to our movies. Just like but, it kind of catches the audience because last week's Pathfinder was fucking painful to get through. (laughs) Yes. It was just, it was a really hard movie to get through. And honestly, when we were doing our final thoughts, I wanted to say, honestly, I stopped paying attention about halfway through because fuck this movie. (laughs) So considering we spent most of the uh, movie talking about everything else, but the movie. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. You know, let's talk about the failures of Batman V Superman, or let's talk about why the Marvel cinematic universe actually works or, Let's talk about like why Lord of the Rings is a bunch better movie than this one for other than obvious reasons. That's Anything all. Anything but this. Yeah. <clears throat> but Dan, real quick, you have been listening to the way Tom edits these things. We are right now in the intro because he doesn't actually start when we start the intros. He starts before. It's like oh. this right here is the intro. Oh, fine. <laughs> meta. <That> meta. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, I'm kind of glad I didn't have anything typed out. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fire pit where movies go to burn. I am Dan, otherwise known as Nigel. And, uh... (laughs) Amazing (laughs) intro. I love it. God damn, I had it, too. I've been even rehearsing this fucking thing. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Anyways, welcome to the fire pit uh, podcast. I'm Dan, otherwise known as Nigel. And tonight we are watching... That's Not, your, uh, your cue, Tom. Oh, it's Mike. I thought it was Josh's cue. Good. Josh is doing the I'm intro. doing the rundown. You are doing your intro. Okay. Uh, One more time <laughs> with the intro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fire Pit Podcast. I'm Dan, otherwise known as Nigel. And tonight we're watching... What are we watching? Well, Dan, thank you for asking. This is Tom, also known as Thompson. We are watching the seminal 90s classic... Starship Troopers. How does this link up with last week's movie? The classic, classic, classic 
Pathfinder. Well, I'm also glad we naturally segued into that, Dan. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so in the last film, Pathfinder, we watched Carl Urban, who actually has been in a lot of films and actually, that was the one we picked <laughs> yeah of all the carl urban films we could have picked we would have picked we should have picked that was the one we went with um in that film we had clancy, no, wait, brown. clancy brown clancy brown thank you very much who uh played the you can tell how well we love the last film just by how much Named all Viking in. Too. <laughs> it, yeah, King Viking. He was the King Viking. He was Carl Urban's dad in the last film. The resemblance was uncanny. He was actually his dad because I, I didn't get that. I well. Okay, it, anywho, <laughs> I had to. Re- I had to do that part on our uh, "Where are they now?" type thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Boy, we're we're killing it tonight, guys. <laughs> anywho, I'm uh, Josh, or my uh, English name is Reginald. As Thompson said, we are watching Starship Troopers tonight. It came out in 1997. It has an R rating and has a runtime of about two hours and nine minutes. This is a Paul Verhoeven uh, directed classic, in my opinion. And this holds a special place in my heart, as our longtime viewers will know. This was my first rated R movie. <laughs> so I am looking forward to this tonight because I always enjoy this movie, no matter how many times I've seen it. Wait, was this the first rated R movie you ever saw, or was this the first one you were allowed to go see without your parents? Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Yes, it was my first rated R movie I got to see by myself in theaters. Okay. Mm -hmm. And to confirm, your parents did know that you were going to go see this. They did. They dropped me off at the theater. I walked in and paid like $2.50 or whatever it was and went and watched the movie. It was awesome. The 90s were a different time. You know, it's kind of funny that that just to link the movies together here, it's kind of funny that Starship Troopers was your first rated R movie that you saw without your parents. My first rated R movie that I can remember watching, period, is RoboCop, which is also a Paul Verhoeven movie. That's the very first rate. I know I may have seen a rated R movie before I watched RoboCop when I was a kid, but RoboCop's the first rated R movie that I can clearly remember. Oh, this is what rated R movies are like. You know, I don't remember blood, if it blood, was uh, guts and boobs and all that. So yeah, like I, I would thinking back on it, I know I watched RoboCop as a kid, but it'd be a toss-up. Would be my first rated R would be either RoboCop or Terminator Two. So that's yeah, that's a qualifier too. I mean, did you see RoboCop on like HBO or one of the uh, other places where they would have, or like on VHS where it would have been uh, uncut, or did you see it on like TBS or whatever where it was butchered to hell? Oh, no. Um, I saw RoboCop on VHS. My um, uncle, Paul, who was a big movie aficionado, had the VHS and uh, I watched it. And my parents, they didn't know much about it. And I got I watched the movie because they were only familiar with the RoboCop because there was a line of toys and there was an animated series and a video <laughs> game. And they didn't yeah, think rated it, they film definitely wasn't marketed at children, right? Yeah, they thought it wasn't as bad as it really was. See, I didn't watch it alone. We took it home and we watched it, and I watched it with my parents because they didn't think they didn't think it was going to be any worse than some other movies. And uh, yeah, my that was cool. Oh, God, it was because of that movie. My mom was like all about locking down rated R movies for a while because it was like <laughs> they had a strict like we have to watch it first and then we'll see if Dan can watch it later or something like that. Jesus Christ, I'm a <laughs> terrible parent by your parents' standards. Then because oh yeah i'm an awful parent i'm an awful colin have already watched robocop the unrated edition mind you you know the one that's only like (laughs) a minute and a half longer and it's only on those scenes where people are getting shot up to hell yeah well like they thought they honestly because i i I can't remember what it was but maybe robocop wasn't the first rated r movie i saw it might have been die hard but die hard's not gory it's just got a lot of f-bombs in it that's Mm -hmm. why it's got an r rating you know and there's a lot of gunfights in it but there's there's um there's not really a lot of gore in Die Hard, mm-hmm. so there's just a lot of gunfights and there's a lot of, but, and then there's a little bit of drug. There's a little bit of drugs in Die Hard, but RoboCop had like RoboCop. Shit, there was. Uh, remember the scene where he's snorting coke off the chick's tits? Dude, <laughs> there's well, yeah, there's the boobs, there's the drugs, there's the violence, there's the gore, there's f bombs galore. There's uh, RoboCop ticked all the R-rated boxes. <laughs> yeah, we we'll talk about that yeah. movie, and uh, we, we should get back on topic after this. But <laughs> RoboCop was originally going to be rated NC-17 because it was so gory. They actually asked the director uh, to tone it down for so it could get the R rating. Like, but, fine, I'll take out the scene where a guy gets his arm shot off with a shotgun. Um, I can keep the tits in the cocaine, right? 
course, it's the 80s. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but, but, but to link the movies together, to link the movies together, Paul Verhoeven directed both RoboCop and Starship Troopers. And RoboCop, yes, the movie's violent, action, gore, all the good stuff. But it also had a message in it. He was uh, heavily satirizing major corporations and advertisements and stuff like that. Like there's a there's a message in RoboCop. But much Dude. like uh, the film we're going to watch, that message I think kind of got lost on a lot of people because most people just wanted to buy that for a dollar. They <laughs> and watch the dude get shot in the balls. Yes. But you know, uh, Starship Troopers does the same thing. It's based on a book. Uh, I had the name. E. Line. Yeah. Yeah, rubber uh, Heinlein, Heinlein, Heinlein. I thought it was Hein. I thought it was Heinlein. Heinlein. I don't know. I read the book. The book is actually really good, but it's nothing like the movie. Yeah, like nothing like the movie. Like, I put this into perspective. How different it is. You're like it, you in the movie. He you meet uh, Johnny Rico's parents, right? Yeah. Well, um, in the book, his dad actually joins his uh, squad. No he isn't shit. Killed. Yeah, like the book is totally different. Like just even down to the basic parts, like the star. It's been years since I've read it, so I probably got some details wrong. But like they have these uh like more mechanized suits, and they can jump uh really far, and they have like uh, I forget what the name of it is, but they have this like uh a bomb that'll roll through the city or something, and it'll uh, I'm not even gonna mention it because it's been so long since I've read it. But it's nothing like the movie, nothing. Like yeah. I honestly, I I think the only real thing that's maintained is the character names and the name of the movie itself. But, yeah, and I, I think the uh, the names of some of the areas they go to, like Klindathu and all that, are are the same in the book. But yeah, you're right though. The book is presented much differently. Um, mm-hmm. The feder the Federation thing is presented differently. Fascist overtones are much more prevalent in the book than they are in mm-hmm. the movie. But again, but again, this was uh, Vanderhoven. He was going for the deep satire with this film, which unfortunately I think went again much like Robocop went over a lot of people's heads yeah it's it's yeah most people probably saw the blood the guts and the boobs yep it's like oh it's a it's a cheesy action film with um space marines fighting bugs That's also all if, if i remember uh, the advertising for this movie was presented much differently than the movie itself like it presented it more like a uh aliens type movies where space marines are fighting mm-hmm. aliens and yes that's a chunk of the movie but that's not really what the movie's about so yeah. the, adver- the advertising for this movie, I think, threw a lot of people off. Like they went into the theater expecting one thing and, and got another. Mm-hmm. Was but this movie successful? I don't know. It was kind of a bomb. If, I, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, and Josh, you're going to have to confirm this, but I remember yeah, it yeah. kind of being a uh, – it tanked. Like you said, it was mismarketed. Uh, Much like Robocop, there were toys for this. I remember uh, yeah. play sets. All right, here's here's the details on that, uh, the budget of the movie. The budget is reported at $105 million. Now, for 1997, that was quite a bit of money. Yeah. Over a $100 million budget in 97. Think about that. I think Jurassic Park had one, like, a, a $60, $70 million budget. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That, that only came out four years prior to this movie. Now, domestically, this movie made $54 million. And internationally, it made 66, coming to a grand total of about 121. Now, keep in mind... And again, correct me if I'm wrong. Advertising budget is not included in the budget, which can sometimes be up to 50% of the actual production budget. So now, it is ho- currently holding a 63% on Rotten Tomatoes. But um, I think part of it think- is it, the movies become more appreciated later in mm-hmm. life as opposed to its initial release. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like it, it's, it found its audience on VHS. Yeah, there's uh, a there's a great YouTube channel called Joe Blow Movies where they have a segment called WTF Happened to This Film, and mm-hmm. Starship Troopers was one of them featured. And they went into a lot of detail on why this movie wasn't as successful as they probably wanted it to be. And Red Letter Media did like a review of this, too. This is one of those films that across – the internet at least everyone hits once because it's it's uh, one it's a it's hard to miss film, and it's hard to miss yeah it's like it is that one film for those of us of our generation that at some point you either saw it on tv yes a friend had it on tape or you went to like a bad movie night at a theater and or if you've had it, a friend's going to be like, dude, you haven't seen Star Wars Troopers? Well, come on. Star you got to see this Troopers. film. Yeah, I know. It's like, damn, I'd almost see that movie. Starship that, That's its own thing there, Tom. Tom. That, that's its own thing. Star Wars right. Troopers is the name of his fan fiction that he's writing. Well, um, 
to like for the week opening weekend. This opened on uh, November November seventh, nineteen ninety seven. Opening weekend, it did place number one. Number two was Bean. Oh, <laughs> it, it, it beat out. Uh, I know what you did last summer, which got number one the previous week, mm-hmm. and uh, Devil's Advocate and Red Corner. So, you know, it, it was it was this, like you guys said, it's good. It was a good film, but it was definitely underappreciated in its day. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, and for the younger people in our audience, they're definitely going to recognize some of the scenes or or from this movie that have since now become memes. There's a lot. <laughs> this movie, this movie has generated a lot of memes. Mm-hmm. Or the mm-hmm. armor. They will recognize the armor because this movie, at the time, I don't know if it's been broken since, but I remember reading in the papers and it would say that this had the most extras ever hired for a single film. So this had a record at one point for having the most extras, and each of these extras had a suit of armor. Now, over the years, these suits of armor have been bought and sold and reused in almost like every low-budget film and TV show. If you watch the show Firefly, this is the exact same armor that they have for their uh, Alliance uh, troopers in there are the same ones that was used in Starship Troopers. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever... Of, of the audience listening, Josh, I don't think anyone's ever seen Firefly. Um, it's not that good It is anyways. almost 20 years old. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's not that good anyway, so... Yeah. Dan's the villain this week, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, if it was a better show, it would have lasted longer. Also, it was Fox in 2001. They canceled everything. They did. They did. That for Simpsons and Family Guy. No, they canceled Family Guy, too. Simpsons oh, was yep, the only they one did, they canceled. did. Well, let's get this thing started. Well, right. well before we start, though, I do want to, like, go back real quick to see what we our last... Our connections. Yeah. We so, just... Uh... Drop ball on oh. segment. So, about Carl Urban, who was our guy from the last mm-hmm. film, honestly, he's not a lot of movies coming up right now. He's, I mean, he's been busy. Carl Urban has been busy. Um, Judge Dredd, you, if you haven't seen Judge Dredd, in fact, it was a toss-up between Pathfinder and Judge Dredd. Or Dredd. Ex- yeah, yeah, Dredd. yeah, Judge Dredd, Dredd is Sylvester Stallone movie. Dredd yes. is the Carl Urban movie. Yes. Same character, let, different actors, but different quality of film, too. And let yeah, the two the 90s, never... Uh... <laughs> yeah, let, let the two never be confused. Yeah. Ever. Um, but Dread was one of those films that no one saw. And honestly, if you haven't seen it, do see it. Right now, he's in a show called The Boys, which is, I think, on Amazon Prime. Second season right now, too. Um, be out in summer next, this summer. Because the last one came out like June or July. So it's Amazon's typically gone a year. Other than that, he he kind of keeps his head down. No, he, he's he's married with kids. He keep, He keeps a low profile. That's what our boy's been up to since uh, this past film. So I uh, look forward to the next season of The Boys. And again, hopefully if they ever come up with either a Dread TV show or whenever they make a new new Trek, a Kelvinverse Trek. Yeah, so. IMD- IMDb does have him listed in, as McCoy in the latest not yet done or not yet even filmed Star Trek movie. That is currently in development hell right now mostly over money with chris pine and uh, chris hemsworth because uh, they were nobodies when the first movie was made and now they're both somebodies uh mm-hmm. both of them attached to major comic book franchises yeah so, captain kirk and captain kirk's dad uh, have grown on to become steve trevor and thor uh, hopefully <laughs> but uh, you know what i'd like to see another abrams uh star trek movie i think those are fun movies and urban is amazing in him and i'm still waiting for the inevitable kelvin verse next generation line where they hire james mcavoy to play the rebooted picard because that's the only thing we're going to allow (laughs) (laughs) but on that note shall we uh starship some troopers guys yeah that sounds like a plan all right and play Congratulations on scoring yourselves front row seats to yet another episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your editor, usher, referee, and Casper Van Dean of your dream, Tom. This week's episode is made possible by Dayton Brew Company's Experimental IPA. No, they aren't sponsoring us, but we are drinking them. And with booze, you can't lose. So don't lose with some Dayton Brews. Mmm! We do look to get some sort of sponsorship set up in the future, but you know we're a new podcast, so some of you would-be businesses might be wondering, could these fellows convey our products in a mature, professional manner befitting our corporate image? Well, why don't you just let me and Josh answer that question for you? 
I'm looking at Denise Richards right here, and I'm thinking, oh man, girl, if only you knew the hell you're going to get your life into. You know what she should have invested in? What's that, Josh? She should have invested in some horse dick lipstick. <laughs> horse because dick lipstick? Do tell. This is, this is specialized lipstick made specifically from horse dicks. Horse dicks have the most nutrients and vitamins and nutrients of any other part of the horse. It's so many nutrients you had to mention that twice. I did, I did. And not because I couldn't think of anything else, but because she needs that horse dick lipstick. When you think of horse dick, you can't think of anything else. I know, you lick your lips just thinking about it. Am I right? Not me, mm. I'm, the, I'm, I'm the only one. I'm the, am, am I real? Am I the only one? Mm, no, no, no. What's even better is this patented horse dick lipstick. It's even like in the lipstick thing, when you roll it up, it's in the shape of a horse dick. So you get the tactile feel of it too, of having that horse dick on your lips. Is your it... lips will look fuller and more luscious. Oh, just talk... Now, is it the actual size of a horse dick, too? Cause oh, if no, I'm... it can't be the actual size, Tom. Come on. It's the size of standard lipstick, but it just looks like a horse dick. For me, I want the full experience of having a horse dick on my lips when I get my horse well, dick I lipstick. I didn't want to say anything now, but we do have down the line. It's, it's still uh, in product testing, but we are expecting to release a true-to-size horse dick lipstick. Now, it's a, in the back form of a backpack, and it will have straps, but then you can actually hold it and put it on your lips, and it is the actual size of a horse dick. Because for me, that's it's exciting, because I need that. I've got these full Sicilian lips. I need all that on my lips. So that's so that's exciting news. I'm, that's horse dick lipstick. <laughs> Order yours oh, look. today. Astounding. Well, that's it for me. I'll let you get back to the podcast. As always, thank you for listening, and good luck. It's like I said, yo, after this movie, I thought Casper Van Dien was the cat's pajamas. I've never seen any other film that he's been in, so... I've seen a few. This was the best. I'm clapping. I'm not masturbating. I'm clapping. I'm masturbating. This is me masturbating. I'm masturbating now, but I was clapping. <laughs> closing remarks. I honestly, I, I would have to say if my closing thoughts on this movie is I like it better every time I watch it. Despite all of its obvious flaws, I like this movie better. And one of the big things that stood out this particular viewing was the satire, but namely I would have to name the uh, score. The, the musical soundtrack was amazing. was definitely the best part of this movie. Tyre and the other stuff that we basically uncovered as we were watching it is a close number two. I think the soundtrack really gives that impending doom. It's, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say epic because epic is safe for something like Star Wars, those big things. But this is it has the war movie feel to it. It fits so well. Nigel, your thoughts. Nigel is He's stunned still, in his still silence. Fapping, still fapping to the movie. No, I was saying, I haven't seen this movie in a while, and I forgot how good the score really is. Like, it's, and it's not surprising yet. It's the same guy who scored RoboCop, which is a great score. Hump for Red October, great score. Conan the Barbarian, great score. Some, some guys just have it. I mean, they're not John Williams. Some composers really get it. This one had a score that hits the beats at just the right time. Like, the music is subdued when it needs to be subdued. And it's big and sweeping and epic when it needs to be big and sweeping. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also that, that scene where the, the bugs are about to overrun that base is perfect oh music God. for just yeah, how just like dire dread. the situation really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dread. I mean, it's like your gut sinks. Yeah, it's, it's the music that's playing, you know, saying everyone here is going to die. <laughs> like, I, get that, I, I get that same feeling in that scene that I got in RoboCop whenever the Ed 209 or 201 or whatever it was was like blasting RoboCop stairwell. Yeah. It's just like, he's like struggling and that's when the cops turned against him because he tried to arrest the head of OCP or whatever it was. I remember the soundtrack in that scene, or at least it's like, holy shit, that entire scene right there just felt, you know, oh my God, what's going to happen now? Yeah. I know it's a different composer, but it had the same kind of beats uh, score-wise from that scene in The Lord of the Rings when Boromir is about to die and the uruk are about to overrun them. Music is incredibly important in a film. Specifically it's, because it'll help bring out that emotional struggle or that emotional triumph. Yeah, in and the it's, in the best movies that we think of, 
that are in the zeitgeist of, of considered best movies of all time have phenomenal scores. Granted, most of them are scored by John Williams, but oh, yeah, like, I mean, you just think about Star the Indian. Yeah, how, how the Star, Star Wars, Wars be without the soundtrack? Seriously, yeah, mm-hmm. it's like like how yeah. how important is is score in a movie? Like Star Wars, going back to Star Wars, it's like the perfect storm. It has great special effects, good acting, amazing score. I mean, that's one thing nobody will discredit from Disney trilogy is the fact that the score was phenomenal. The movie, the script, not so much. And I think this film right here embodies how important yeah. a good score is. It's the frosting on the cake. It's you not can just eat that. I mean, I would say it's more the use no, but of see, I don't, because, but I don't think the music. I don't think music as is, is as important as the stories and the scripts and all that. Because I know some movies that have more subdued scores that are, I think, you know, are better movies. Mm. But the prequel trilogy is proof that it's just frosting. Because I'll just buy the soundtrack and just listen to it, and then I don't have to eat the cake. We were talking earlier. It's like uh, two similar films, Deep Impact and Armageddon. What we cannot argue. That of the two, Deep Impact is the better film, but Armageddon is the more memorable film, and its soundtrack, its score fits it perfectly. It's yes, that epic I will go with, with that pop the music. music. You know, but at the same time, I think that sometimes it's a vital component. I think in some movies, it's like the sugar in the recipe. Mm. Not you know, it's like used in every level, and it builds up on that, and it makes it so much better. Like without well, it. It would be garbage. Well, but, like, you know, bad frosting can ruin good cake. Yeah, so that's... yeah, so music, so bad music or wrong music can ruin a good movie. And I'm trying to think of a movie where the music would have been the sugar in the recipe. Now I want a cake. Thank you, guys. This and, was. Why a... does all of our metaphors go back to food? Okay, I can think of two movies, both of them scored by John Williams, where the the, the score is the sugar in the recipe. Superman and Indiana Jones. I Boom. See that. Yes. Absolutely yes. Yeah, because you hear that Superman theme, I mean, you still associate it with the character thirty or yeah, thirty some odd years later. So and, and, guys, and, and, real quick, let's ahead. finish up this movie. Um, <laughs> you know, like the score really emphasized the emotional impact of certain scenes, specifically like when they were when they were being uh, overrun on that one on the fort t- near the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. So those 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 are my ending thoughts, uh, Thompson. What, what what is your uh, if you had to sum the movie up in like one to five sentences? What would be your ending thoughts on the film? Well, we 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 cracked a little bit about. About this but it's i've seen this film at least seven times for different venues different friends different reasons more i'm thinking about especially now that i've seen it with you this film why people consider it so bad air quotes it's good is paul Verhoeven. much like robocop before it the satire was so deep it wasn't that it went over everyone else's head, just everyone else just passed right over it. It was beat for beat, right in line with a standard World War II punch the Nazis propaganda sort of film. Down to, like, you pointed this out too, Josh, and I never would have caught this, and I gotta say this in this back end. Like, when they're smashing the Earth bugs because they look like sp- Base bugs because the only good bug is a dead bug dude it's been but, 20 years that i had ever caught it sorry i didn't mean to cut you off no no it's again that was perfect the way you know just one of those epiphany moments and i think really what hurt it was it's just so over the top and it's gratuitous almost i mean decapitation blood explosion tits that's all anyone could ever see this like cornball exploitativeness of the film and that's why today most people still think this is a pro fascism film despite all the evidence like no and it's very much an anti-fascism film not as pro-fascism film dan what are uh now, now that tom had his 35 sentences as opposed to five thanks tom uh, okay well i'm gonna say what what really struck me because this is coming off the back of us watching Pathfinder last week, which was just a drawl at a bore. Just one of those. It, I mean, yeah, it was like a math test. It's just, I have to get through this, but it kind of made me realize that when we were got to talking about Casper Van Dien and how you thought when you watched this movie, when you were younger, that he was just the coolest actor ever. And then you see the other stuff he's in. You're like, Hey, he's not really that good. And honestly, outside of the established actors, like Clancy Brown and Michael Ironside in the movie, and outside of Neil Patrick Harris, 
who did find newfound fame on like how i met your mother and all that the other actors and actresses in this movie didn't go on to do great things like they're not none of them are oscar contenders so to speak or household names like dynamire and denise richards and casper van dien and it got me to thinking you know that we see the reverse last week was the reverse last week we had clancy brown and carl urban who no one here is going to argue that neither one of those guys is a bad actor and, and even moon bloodgood is a pretty good actress their performances in that movie last week weren't great but they were still better than or better than some can do in that role this movie casper van dien who is not necessarily a great actor but turned in a really good performance makes me realize that you know that one of the main differences between a good director and a bad director is a good director can get a good performance mm -hmm. out of a mediocre actor like Casper Van Dien. And Paul Verhoeven's a good director. And not just Robocop, not just uh, Starship Troopers. He's done some good movies. And he mm -hmm. gets good performances from his actors. And that parallels Robocop because not a whole lot of the actors in Robocop went on to be super famous outside of Peter Weller. But Peter Weller's mostly well, famous yeah, for being Weller Robocop. Wasn't that, uh famous afterwards. I mean, name another movie that he did beyond Robocop and Star Trek. Why don't he the abyss? Yeah, he's done bit parts. He hasn't done he's his no, last he's got like a yeah. series of team up cop movies that he's done. But we don't yeah. know him for those movies. We know him because he's and, and some sci fi fans would know him also from Buckaroo Banzai. Talk um, about a film so bad it's good. Yeah. <laughs> so Peter Weller is probably the most famous actor to come out of Robocop. Um mm -hmm. outside of uh uh the, oh god Red Foreman from uh, uh Kurtwood Smith, Kurtwood Smith from that 70s show. Not just that 70s show. Kurtwood Smith from everything. Seriously, look up his IMDb file. He's been in everything. If there's a show on TV, Kurtwood Smith's probably done a part on it. And if there's a movie in Hollywood, Kurtwood Smith's there somewhere. I think he even gets a credit if he's just happens to be walking by the set that day. But anyways, I'm just saying that Paul Verhoeven gets good performances out of his actors, even when his actors aren't necessarily household names or, 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 or aren't Oscar winning actors. And in turn, last week's Pathfinder is a bad director can get a bad performance out of his actors. You know, Clancy Brown and, and Carl Urban are both in Pathfinder. And I don't remember a fucking line or a moment from that movie that makes me think, oh, man, that's why you cast them. Well, in this film, too, it's like we all paid attention to this film. Yeah, we did. We had deep philosophical conversations. We asked ourselves moral questions. Yeah. Did we ask any of that during Pathfinder? We asked um, what was better, Batman v Superman or Captain America 3. We asked what was better, Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so basically, is this movie kept our attention? You would think that a movie you watch once or for the first time, you know, it's just like... And just out of curiosity, I know I've seen this like five or six times. How many times have you seen this film, guys? This Dude. is at least 10. I mean, I've seen this movie a half, uh, probably at least a half a dozen times I've seen this movie. Mm -hmm. I, let's put it like this. I probably watched this movie at least once a year. This has been the this has been the first time in a long time I've seen the movie all the way through. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when I catch it, it's usually channel surfing and I see it on TV for a couple of minutes and I watch uh, if it's especially if it's near the scene where the base is about to be overrun. I almost always turn it on or leave it on for a little bit and watch that scene. Mm -hmm. This has been a while since I've seen the movie all the way through, but it's I, I don't know. I've never not enjoyed it when I watched it. And you and just from talking, we all found something new, even in this time that we saw it. It's like I said, this movie gets it's like every time I watch this movie, I like it more. Yeah. Like I never like if I wouldn't have been watching this movie with you guys this time, I probably wouldn't have had that epiphany about the bugs, you know? And this is a quote unquote so bad it's good film. No, it's like we're too dumb to really appreciate this movie. Yeah. Like I know I know I've been for twenty three years I've been too dumb to appreciate this movie. I don't even consider myself smart enough to appreciate it yet. Yeah, I think this this definitely i would not say this is a movie that's so bad it's good this is a movie that's just above us it's like it goes over our head yeah it's so good. I, i've always hated the argument that well you don't get it because you're just the movie's too smart for you because a lot of the um dceu fans have a tendency to use this argument with when arguing batman v superman or a uh, man of steel or or even birds of prey or not birds of prey no one's arguing that movie's good they always use the argument oh you, the movie's just too smart you didn't get it no, 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 it's no. not. 2001 A Space Odyssey might be too smart, but so Batman v Superman Troopers. is not. I would say Starship Troopers might be one of a qualifier that one of the, this is a movie that, that's too smart for me. Yeah. Just because it feels like, especially after watching it tonight and seeing that one scene, like I identified one scene. 
that I didn't realize after watching this movie almost yearly for 23 years. Um, I would definitely say this is a movie that was too smart for 17-year-old me when I went to see it, or 18-year-old me when I went to go see it in the movie theater. Because when I saw it with uh, our friend Matt, you know, and I, Matt and I went to go see it in the theaters, and I t- at the time, I just kind of saw it as a sci-fi action movie with a bunch of bugs and guns and bullets and explosions boobs. in it. And, and boobs, boobs in it. Yeah, boobs. boobs in it. I just saw it as another typical rated R summer action flick. Not, I never mm-hmm. got the deep meaning of the movie until much later in life. So would we say then the movie was smarter than the movie itself? Yes. It's plot. And I could say that. I, uh, the main plot isn't very deep, but everything that, like the stuff that adds to it, like yeah. the Tropic mm-hmm. Thunder and the movie yeah. previews beforehand, adding everything in it makes it a, a lot deeper film, if you want to call it that. But mm-hmm. it's like, I, I never would have, like, I honestly think there's still stuff, like if we watch this movie again tonight, we would find new stuff about it to appreciate. Yeah, it's definitely a movie that I would recommend to someone who's watched it. And when the five asked them, have you only seen it once? And they say, eh, it was okay. I'd say, watch it again. Yeah, watch it again. Like, because every time you watch it, you might find something else. You might like, I, understand I remember, something uh, a little more. And, but it took us how many times to see it to get it? I mean, is it because we as audience members are just too dumb or we're just so used to satire films beating us over the head with the message well, that we I don't... Was, mm-hmm. And it's like, maybe Paul Verhoeven is just that much smarter than us. Wait, could he have done something else to, to get it across, though? I mean, I mean, what did he have to do? Like, make the aliens, like, freaking Neopets from the freaking Wii? It, it's just like, what if the, the aliens was Japanese or, you know, German? I'm just throwing it out there. Make the aliens look Japanese, and then the, the look at that that one commercial mm-hmm. with the uh, only good bug is a dead bug. Mm-hmm, Replace mm-hmm. the word bug with the you know, or you know, the only good German mm-hmm. Krauts. They called them Krauts back then. Yeah, the only good Kraut. You know. Yeah. I was just saying, you know, you've got in that terms, like the only good bug is a dead bug. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I never would have thought about that. Well, term. the idea of using the bugs as the bad guys instead of like a different uh, humanoid alien race or whatever, so, quote unquote, dehumanize the enemy, which is exactly. what you do in propaganda films is you dehumanize the enemy. Mm-hmm. Let's see, even now, just because you said that. This movie has more level yeah. to it than I have. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> but that's what they do. Like, if you look at the propaganda posters of back then, look at how the Japanese drew American soldiers and look at how American propaganda drew Japanese soldiers. They didn't draw them even remotely accurate. It was yeah. to humanize them and make them into demons and all that. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, so that when you read in the papers that 2,000 Japanese people or soldiers were killed in this battle, whatever, you don't feel anything for it. Like I said, I think if we watch that movie again tonight, we would have another level of appreciation for it. Vanderhoven is just too smart. That's yeah, he's too smart for his own good. Is. <laughs> Vanderhoven is smarter than us in terms of at least storytelling. You know, we can't fully appreciate what this man has to say unless we watch this movie twenty three plus times. But you know, all in all, good movie. I really enjoyed it tonight. Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely a nice palate cleanser from uh, last week. Uh, yeah. Last weekend, you know. Okay. Yeah. So, so no, going on to our next segment, we'll call this segment next week, tentatively titled. We uh, originally planned to go f- on to use our springboard as Michael Ironside going into Top Gun. Mm-hmm. Now yes. let's let's discuss options. Now I'm not saying we are not going to do that one. I'm not going to lie, uh, Total Recall is a fantastic film. I have not seen it all the way through from beginning to end in one sitting. So for me, it would be a win. So let's just open up the floor to discussion. What other possibilities could we do? Top Gun, I'm not looking at any others. Also in Total Recall, which oh, I think has a relatively popular... Austri- uh, Austrian actor in it. If, I, I can't recall his name, though. I definitely can't spell it. Tom Arnold. Yes. No, wait, though, no, that's uh, True Lies. I'm thinking True Lies. You are. You are. <laughs> but I just, I, I'm only saying that because I've got Robocop loaded up and I see Total Recall. I'm like, holy shit, Paul Vero even directed that, too. <laughs> but the reason I'm, I'm interested in Top Gun, not just because I saw it in uh, theaters like a year or two ago uh, when Gateway was doing a thing. Mm. Uh, and I kind of want to see that film with again, well, with all, not again, just with you guys. But also, we've seen some corny, bad films, and now we're going to see some just fun films. I think this, for me, it does open us up. I, I know it's looking a little farther in the future. There's some really good films, like some quote-unquote classic films, that this opens us up. There's potential with Paul Newman. 
because Tom Cruise was with Paul Newman in the Color, the of, Color Money. of Money. And uh, Paul Newman was in The Hustler, which was Color of Money is a sequel to The Hustler, which I, I didn't know was a sequel until I saw it at another theater. They were doing some classic films. Paul Newman opens the doors to a lot of really classic actors. So, again, continuing with the natural theme of we've had some cor- we've had some shitty, we've had some corny, we'll have some classic. Just, just so that's that's why I want to go Top Gun. We can chew on that one. So, Top Nigel, Gun, your Top thought? Gun, it's, Top Gun itself has so many options because of all the actors and actresses that are in that movie. But I mentioned that earlier today. Quite a few of them have had good careers in Hollywood. Michael Ironside, uh, you know, even Anthony Edwards, mm-hmm. uh, Tim Robbins. Uh, he was the in first major pain. Wait, Damon Wayans. It opens oh up yeah, Link man. Uh, <laughs> I think you mentioned that like an early one, Blank Man. I remember having fond memories of that film. Do I want to get it ruined again? No, no, Maybe. no. To see it. Not mm-hmm. that we really. We, we well, still I still want to do it. Top Gun. I want to do Top I, Gun I next week. I think as Top our Gun would be an movie. amazing top. Like I was. I just listened to Danger Zone tonight, and I'm like, yeah, we need to do No, no, no. The best song from that soundtrack isn't Danger Zone. It's Cheap Tricks, Mighty Wings. Listen to that and thank me later. No, no. I'd have to argue with that. I'd have to argue with that. It's Playing With The Boys by Kenny Loggins. Quick intersect. You're all wrong. The best song from that film is Love and Feeling by The Righteous Brothers. Oh, well, that's a classic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. no. As sang by... Anthony Edwards and Tom Cruise. Abilities are- Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm going all wrong here. We go Terminator 2, right? Okay, then we just go backwards. We take Linda Hamilton from Terminator 2 and go back to Terminator 1. Okay, go Terminator 1. Then from Terminator 1, go Michael Bean to Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Game over, Michael. man. Game, Game over. over. Game I mean, over. And then we could take Paul Rudd. Or not Paul Rudd. Yeah, <laughs> Paul Rudd. Go. Fucking... Twister guy. <laughs> I have no idea. I haven't What's seen his name? Chubby Checkers. I don't oh, know. That's the only guy to be killed by an alien, a predator, and a Terminator. Sean Bean. My- no, oh. no. God damn it. He was in Twister. Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, but no, I was just thinking, like, we could just go backwards. Just go Terminator 2 to the Terminator to Aliens. And then we can and- go back from, from that. And then we can go, like, Aliens. Then takes the Gordon Weaver and go back to Alien, and then <laughs> I was just saying like, oh, and then we got Tom Skerritt back in at Alien. We can still get the Top Gun. Boom! <laughs> it's a little indirect path. Yeah, we can still get the Top Gun from there. Okay, let's do the thing. How can we get to Independence Day on July Fourth? Uh, oh, how many? How many weeks? Do we, okay, wait, 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 wait. How many? So we how many weeks do we have? How many weeks? Hold on, let me see. Let me see here. We gotta figure One, this. Oh, now I gotta figure this out before we get to term. Four, or I'm gonna be five, me. six. It'll be July third. Okay, We've so got- let's say we watch. One, Top Gun. Two, okay, I'm, I'm gonna. You guys are gonna hear me typing. Five. I think we got about five six weeks. Six weeks. We got One, six. Two. Okay. Right. So then It'll let's say. Six. Okay, let's say we go Top Gun, and then we take from Top Gun. We get to what? What movie are we trying to get to? Independence Day. Inde- Independence Day on July third. So July 3rd is a Friday. Okay. So let's say Top Gun. Uh, we, we go. A chart one for this. One, two, three. Oh, Bill Pullman is in Independence Day. Hey, right. So hold on. I, I think I, I may have this. We, if we go Top Gun to That's next Meg week, Ryan. One. Okay. Take Meg two. Ryan. Huh? It's two. I'm counting it. Yeah, and take Meg Ryan. And then she was married to Dennis Quaid. So I don't know. That doesn't count, though. No. Um, <laughs> Let's see here. Um, Ooh, guy, on, I hear on, I think we got to go, what, five weeks? Six. We it'll six be weeks. We got oh. six, it'll be our sixth week. Brent Spiner was an Independence Day. Will you Let me concentrate. I think I can do this. <laughs> I think I Stop throwing actors my way. I think I got it. Hold on. How, well, yeah, I got six movies. Okay, Top Gun's one movie, right? Yes. Okay, and then we go from Top Gun to Meg Ryan, Meg Ryan to Inner Space. Inner Space is two movies, right? Oh, God, I love that movie. Dennis okay. Quaid, yeah. Dennis, okay, Dennis Quaid is in Inner Space. Quaid. We go... Dennis Quaid to the day after tomorrow. All right, let, let, let's rephrase this. So next week is Top Gun. Right. Meg Ryan to Inner Space. That's two weeks from today. Is yeah. Inner Space. And then three weeks from today is go say it again. Day at the day after tomorrow. 
Day after tomorrow, that's three weeks from today. Okay. The day from the day after tomorrow to Independence Day, the sequel, whatever the sequel was called. Uh, uh, that's, Resurgence. Uh, that's no, 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 no. Resurgence. That's Resurgence. That's, that's got Seal Award. And then, for, but that's also got Bill Pullman in it. And then you go from there to Independence Day 1. That's one way to get to six weeks to Independence Day. Uh, we can no, do better. Like we can do okay, better. Okay, well, then you give me a second and we can do better. I think uh, Will Smith is the way to go. Wait, uh, wait, let's, Jen- work back. let's work back from there. I've been thinking Bill Pullman because Bill Pullman was Bill Pullman's in-, in Independence Day. He's in Independence Day. Right. I'm okay, trying to. I'm, I'm going to throw out movies that Will Smith is in because you're thinking Will, you're thinking uh, Bill Pullman. That's good. But you've also got Will Smith and you've also got like a bunch of other. Act- Hell, we could bounce off a Star Trek movie into Brent Spiner and into that movie. Think about that. If we can get to Star Trek in five, we got it. Oh, 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 hang on, hang on. I think we might be onto something. I might think it's going backwards from Bill Pullman, who was in Lake Placid with Brendan Gleeson, who played Mad Eye Moody in the Harry Potter films. I think I figured it out, but you guys aren't going to like it. Probably not. But... <laughs> I think I mm-hmm. Honestly, we're five weeks out. Yeah, we've got well, time, guys. We got time to discuss it. But basically, yeah. no matter what route we take, our goal by next week our introduction should include everybody has to have their own path to getting to independence day <laughs> on the third of july i like this plan it hit me last week how to get to kevin bacon from top gun i'll figure this fucking thing out but everybody mm-hmm. has to present their thesis next week i like this plan i'm gonna have my thesis in an hour just give me some time all right well guys i gotta go take a leak and i need yeah, a same here this has been the fire pit i've been tom i've been, I've been and i've been dan good luck and thanks for watching Thank you.